Uh, this session, uh, we, again, we will be talking about <clears throat> the argument of the existence of God on the basis of morality. Um, and I know that we've talked about this concept at a po- conferences in the years past, but I figured we cover it again because it fits in with, you know, where we are in our cycle talking about, you know, the existence of God. So, um, and all of us know what morality is. You know, we all have experiences, personal experiences with morality. We have all behaved morally, as in morally good. We've, there's been times where we've been generous and we've been honest and we've been caring and kind to other people. There's also been times where we've acted immorally or morally bad, where we have um, maybe lied to someone, hurt someone, insulted someone, acted self-centered and arrogantly. So we, we're, we're well familiar with this concept, even at a personal level. Now, I think I need to clarify what this argument is actually saying because oftentimes I'll hear an apologist go into this argument and immediately the objection goes something like this. Well, the atheists that I know are all generous and kind and loving, good-natured people. It's the religious people I know who are bigoted and arrogant and mean-spirited and whatnot. Um, there's a bumper sticker in my na- on a car in my neighborhood that says something like, Religion is not necessary for morality. Now, the point of the moral argument is not to say that belief in God is necessary for, to have a sense of morality or to act in a morally good way, but we would be arguing that we can't even define foundationally an, an, ob- an objective definition of what is good and what is evil. In other words, if we as people are the only intelligent moral beings in the universe, who's to say what's good and evil? We need a transcendent standard, something outside of humanity um, to be able to actually say something is absolutely good or absolutely evil. So what we're going for here is the idea of an objective morality. Now, (laughs) before I go forward, I feel it's fair to define the word objective. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I just feel that we want to get on a level level playing field here because I'll be using this word a lot. Now, the opposite of the word objective is subjective, okay? Subjective means it's depending on someone's opinion or, or preference. So for example, the statement that chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla ice cream it's, complete, it's completely subjective. You know, it's, it may exist in someone's mind, but it doesn't necessarily exist in the external universe. There's no scientific law that you can appeal to and objectively prove that uh, chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla ice cream. Um, another subjective statement, and this one hits home for me because it's about me, is the statement that Chad is tall, okay? Chad is tall is a subjective statement. Maybe among the 3,000 people here we have in Southwest Ohio, I may be considered taller, but if I were to go on the court uh, of an NBA court where I'm standing amongst the starting five of two teams, I might be the shortest guy on the court. So no one in the stands would say Chad is tall. You know, again, because it's all relative to my context. Now, in terms of objectivity, talking about an objective statement, that you can make about my height would be, Chad is six feet, four inches tall. That doesn't really depend on someone's opinion. That could be verified by facts. Just pull out a measuring stick and you know, you figure it out, okay? So that could be stated objectively. The same with a phrase like two plus two equals four. Um, that does, it is independent on someone's opinion. Whether or not we want to say that two plus two equals four, it's established as a fact that we just know there's two fingers, there's two fingers, oh, there's four. You know, you can't argue with that. Um, Same with the state of Ohio is in the United States of America. No one's going to argue with you on that as established as a fact. Um, They might try, but again, they would be wrong. So that's the idea behind subjective and objective. And I would argue that um, the truth is objective. And you wouldn't think that I would have to argue for that, but there are people out there who love to get into what is called relativism. They like to say, your truth is your truth and my my truth is my truth, right? People love to throw that term out there all the time. But take, for example, there's two people and they both want to go to Canada, okay? And they're going to follow a compass to do so. But let's say that their compass points, says they both say that north 
is in opposite directions of each other. So one guy says that north is that way, the other guy says that north is that way. And say that they both follow what their compass says. Are both of them going to wind up in Canada? No. There is one right answer. There's an objective truth about the placement or the location of the country of Canada. So we're talking about true north. So this is where we get to morality. Is there a true north when it comes to morality? So, and that kind of sets up um, the two questions that we will address um, in this lesson. I left out that slide. Um, The two questions we will address are, do objective moral standards exist? And if so, which worldview offers the best explanation? And then also, um, in doing so, we're going to look at three premises. One is, if God does not exist, then objective moral standards do not exist. Let's, let's take it this way. Um, it's like the old John Lennon song, Imagine. Imagine there is no heaven, no hell below us, above us, only sky. Okay, so if this is all that there is, just you and me, we're the only moral agents there are, who's to say that your standard is better than mine? Who's to say what is the fact of objectivity? Because I might think that you might think murder is wrong. I might think it's perfectly acceptable. Who's to say what's right? right? But we don't live that way. Okay? Um, the, uh, there's an old um, Russian novelist named um, Fyodor Dostoevsky who says, if God is dead, then all things are permissible. So if there is no God, again, who's to say what's morally right or wrong? But the second premise argues that objective moral standards do exist. I mean, we, we have the deepest sense that murder is wrong. And are we going to say that murder is wrong is just our opinion? Or, or do we believe that murder is wrong is like two plus two equals four? What do you think? I would say that deep down we know that we have a sense that there's something about murder that is so repugnant that we know that is a fact that it's wrong. But is it just left to us to decide that? Or is it, again, a, a fact like two plus two equals four? So there we would go conclude that therefore... God exists. So what we'll we'll argue in this next section, do objective moral values exist? Now, when when it comes to morality, again, some people are moral relativists. They say what's true for you or what's good or right for you is right for you and whatever is good and right for me is right for me, you know. Um, a, A lot of times they'll say morality is dictated or derived from the culture that they live in. Um, so when and where you live dictates the moral code that you should follow, okay? So, for example, sex outside of marriage might be perfectly acceptable in culture A, and not morally wrong, but in culture B, it would be considered morally wrong. It's not wrong totally over both of them. It's just wrong in one, but okay in the other. That's the idea of cultural relativism or moral relativism. It's all depending on cultures and individuals and what they feel. So, but at bottom... There are certain statements that a relativist cannot say. A relativist cannot accuse someone of wrongdoing because it's all relative. It's all depending on their culture. For example, we in the West, in America, would say that beating your wife is morally wrong. However, in Islamic countries, some Islamic countries, that's perfectly legal. So the cultural relativist can only say it's wrong for America, but it's fine in Islamic countries. But do we really live our lives like that? Do we really think that, oh, well, that's okay in their country, so we can't make a statement that it's, that it's wrong, right? The idea behind relativism is that, especially when it comes to morality, is that when people differ on it, there's no truth about it. You know, since your opinion on morality is different than mine, there's no truth about it. But we don't apply this to other things in our life. We, we look at these wood beams in this room. You know, I could say, well, those beams are made of oak. And you could say, oh, no, 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 those are made of cedar. Does the fact that you and I have a disagreeing opinion on it change the fact that that is made out of something? Can we say, since we have disagreements about it, there's no truth about the type of wood that that's made out of? No, it's either I'm right or I'm wrong or you're right or you're wrong. I mean, or we could both be wrong. Possibly, but that doesn't mean that there's no truth about it. The cultural relativists, again, cannot accuse people of wrongdoing. They can't look, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in the history of the world. They can't condemn the ancient Mayan practice of human sacrifice as morally wrong. Hey, 
That's just, that's just what they thought. I mean, they thought they were appeasing their gods. They thought that they were doing it for the greater good. So they thought what they were doing is morally acceptable, right? So it's just a cultural distinctive like fireworks on the 4th of July. It's not, it's not morally wrong. It might be morally wrong in America, but not in ancient Mayan Mexico. But do we live our lives that way? Same with the Holocaust. In the 1930s, 1940s Germany, the Nazis thought they were doing humanity a favor. They didn't think it was wrong to murder millions of people. The cultural relativists cannot accuse of the Nazi Germany being wrong. Would we agree with that? Do we just think it's our opinion that the Nazis were wrong? Or do we know that they are violating a standard beyond humanity? Ultimately, what, oh, the only thing that cultural relativism can offer us, I mean, really they would have to say the act of holding a baby tenderly and burning it with a cigarette, they say that those two actions are morally indifferent. They can't come out and say that that is wrong. But nobody lives our lives this way. The actions of all people show that they have a presumption that there is an objective moral standard. Are we red card, green card so far? Are we tracking? Give me a green. Sounds good. All right, green cards. So it's safe to say that... um, there is an objective moral standard. And it's interesting, you'll find out what a relativist truly believes about objective moral standards when stuff is happening to them, right? When they're the one with the problem. You know, what relativist is going to be tied up by a tribe of cannibals as they're discussing over, hmm, uh, rotisserie or extra crispy, you know? He's not just going to, sit, going to be sitting there and saying like, oh, it's culturally relative. What they're doing to me isn't necessarily wrong. I just don't like it. It's not preferred. No, that relativist in his heart of hearts is going to be screaming, this is wrong. It doesn't matter who they are or what they believe, this is wrong, right? Nobody lives like that. Um, Christian philosopher William Lane Craig tells a story about um, a philosophy professor, a friend of his, who had his students write a paper. And one student wrote on this very subject, but he argued that there's no such thing as the concept of good or the concept of evil. There's no such thing as fairness. Um, it's all subjective. It's all relative. So he hands in his paper, and then the professor grades it. He gives the guy an F. He gives the paper back to the student, and the student, what do you think he does? You know, he, he complains, right? He says, oh, well, why'd you give me an F? The professor says, well, you turned it in in a blue folder, and you know, I don't, I'm not such a fan of blue. I don't like blue. What do you think the student said? He says, that's not fair. The professor says, is, wait a minute, isn't this the very paper that argued that there is no such concept of fair? So he taught the student a lesson. He changed his grade just, I mean, I guess, I guess out of mercy. But um, he, I think the, the young man learned a very valuable lesson there in terms of, you know, fairness. How can we make such, you know, claims like that? Um, and it's interesting. Uh, some of us were in here watching the documentary Collision before. And, you know, Christopher Hitchens, who was the atheist arguing often makes these like grandiose like moral statements you know about you know fair but fairness and especially against you know god is saying saying how immoral the idea of god is but what does he have to do you know but the thing is that the christian pointed out is he had to borrow christian standards in order to make a statement that his own worldview doesn't offer to him he had to get into the the car to to carjack it you know um he had to borrow something that isn't naturally in his own worldview. So what we're going to look at next is which worldview offers the best explanation for objective moral standards. And the first one we'll look at is pantheism. Now, this can get complicated, so I'm going to try to be as clear as I can. Um, pantheism is the idea that the physical realm, um, you, me, the table you're sitting at, the chairs, this room, the physical realm is not real but it's what the Hindu call maya or an illusion. It's not really here. We merely think that it's here. But however, the spiritual realm is real. And there's um, a spiritual reality. Um, so, some call it a God. Some call it a force or an energy. I think they only use God to help people in the West to understand it. But it's not a personal God. It's not a mind. It doesn't have a mind in the way that our God has a mind. It's just this impersonal force. And the thing is, is that we are all one with this impersonal force. You know, we are all part of this. So in reality, there's no distinction between you and me. 
And pantheism, all dualisms are, are illusions. Um, there's, all distinctions are illusions. There's no true difference between you and me. That's just an illusion. Think of it as um, raindrops. When raindrops fall into a river, uh, if you're standing on a bridge, can you say, oh, there goes that raindrop once it falls into the river? No, it's just absorbed as part of the river, right? It doesn't have any distinctiveness. It doesn't have an individuality. It's just part of the flow. Pantheists would say that that is true reality. We're all just one with this, we're part of the flow. We're not really individuals. And that's the goal of nirvana. The goal of nirvana, the afterlife, is um, to kind of realize this and, and to become conscious of your oneness with everything and to throw off the illusion of individual personhood. So why cannot pantheism give us an objective moral standard? Well, for one, it's because, again, the difference between you and me is an illusion. How can I harm you if the concept, when there is no difference between us? Does that make sense? If we're the same, how can I harm you? Um, In other words, if I hit you in the head with a hammer, first of all, if the physical realm is an illusion, what hammer? (laughs) It's all an illusion. It didn't really happen. Okay, um, there's a man named Robert Piercig who wrote about his travels to India. And the, there's a professor giving a lecture talking about the illusory nature of the world, how everything's not really here. And so he asked the professor, so he, he said, so are you saying that the atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was just an illusion, that they didn't really happen? The professor smiles and says, yes. It didn't really happen. This is unlivable when you really think about it. I would argue that few to no pantheists could actually live with this worldview when they're staring down a barrel of a gun. They're not going to be thinking, oh, this is just an illusion or unenlightened behavior. They're going to immediately become extremely morally judgmental, right? So I would say that pantheism in that regard is unlivable and therefore does not give us a good solid basis for objective moral values or standards. Next worldview is naturalism. Naturalism is the philosophy that every object and event has a natural cause, thus making um, supernatural explanations unnecessary. Okay? Um, so to explain the grounds for morality, naturalism says morality came about through natural means. Um, uh, for example, as human beings evolved, they developed morality through the process of natural selection. Remember, the idea behind evolution is the survival of the fittest. The, the, um, the species that is best adapted to its environment will survive. And um, it comes about through natural selection, which the definition given here for natural selection is an unguided process through which an organism's genetics are tweaked so that it gets what it needs to increase its chances to survive and to reproduce. In other words, remember, remember the chameleon that Nick was talking about? Let's just say at one time the chameleon was black, but eventually this blind, over mil- thousands of millions of years, this blind random process decided that in, through its genetics, it would start to instill things in this chameleon in order to allow it to survive so that it could propagate its DNA, pass on its genetic code, essentially make babies, have offspring, right? Okay. So just to hear it from you guys, natural selection gives us what? What does it give us? Does someone have an answer? Chandler? Um, So natural, natural selection gives us traits that increase what? Our Our chances of survival for the sake of what? Passing on our genetic code, right? So all naturalism cares about is enabling us to survive and to pass on our genetic code. So basically, in the naturalist worldview, morality is simply something given to us. It's like a trait like camouflage. It's a trait like fur for an animal who lives in a cold climate. It's just something that has evolved in us to help us, that helps us to survive. So isn't that a great thought? You know, take a, and that's what naturalism says about everything about us, our traits and our wirings and our feelings, even things like love, okay? So guys, um, on your wedding day, your bride comes down to you, stands right across from you, you look deep into your eyes, and you, and you can thank evolution for saying, or th- th- so that you can have the thought 
to say such a phrase as, I am biochemically hardwired to have neurological responses that I perceive as positive for this person for the sake of this organism and me having offspring. Ain't love grand. Here's where I see the weakness in the idea that naturalism has given us um, uh, our sense of morality. Take the idea of selflessness or um, altruism, the idea of self-sacrifice. Um, say that, you know, it's the soldier that dies on top of a grenade to save his entire unit, right? Now, does that, in, let's see, okay, so if that, would we consider that to be a morally good thing that he did? Yeah, to, to, in order to save his unit, to dive on top of a grenade, moral, immoral, morally good, right? Thumbs up, okay. So if natural selection, okay, first of all, I'll start with this. Did, did his altruism increase his chances of survival or decrease his chances of survival in this instance? Decrease. This guy's not passing on any more genetic code, okay? So if natural selection is interested in giving us things that help us to survive and to pass on our genetic code, why would it give us such a thing as altruism or, or self-giving, self, selflessness, self-sacrifice? So if you, you, can, if you wanted to put it in form of premise, you could say premise one, naturalism aims to give us what we need to survive. Uh, premise two, selflessness or altruism doesn't always help us to survive. So three, morality does not come through means of natural selection. Objective morality does not. Does not. Um, another, the other example is... Um, Say you live in the woods with your tribe, with your family, okay? So you depend on hunting to, um, to eat, you know, the food, to eat the game. And say that another tribe moves close, closely by to where they too are now hunting in those woods, okay? What are your survival instincts telling you you need to do about this? Yeah, kill them. Get rid of them because they're taking food out of your baby's mouths, right? What's the moral choice to make? Figure out a way to live peaceably, right? Yeah, figure, figure it out. Figure out a way to live peaceably, but not to kill them. So I would say that um, there again, our, our willingness to be moral doesn't seem to help us you know, with our you know, quote-unquote survival chances, and therefore it doesn't seem reasonable to say that natural selection is some, that has, that that's something that it's given us. Um, also, I mean, we can go on the flip side, talking about immoral behavior, um, take, for example, the concept of rape. Does rape, uh, would rape be something that helps the process of us passing on our genetic code, or does it hinder the process of us passing on our genetic code? It helps it. Yeah, you, the more sexual intercourse you have, the more you're going to pr- pr- like pump out offspring. So if that's what rape is, why would, under the evolutionary worldview, would that be considered wrong? Why would natural selection hinder people from doing that and putting something in us to consider rape to be morally wrong as something we shouldn't do when it decreases our when it decreases the offspring that we would make in any other system does it make sense green card red card all right um the thing is i i don't believe that nationalism could give us objective morality because under that worldview we're just we're just animals right we're simply animals um the lion who kills the zebra kills the zebra, but it doesn't what? It doesn't murder the zebra. No one has ever gone to hunt down a lion to bring it before a court of law to be judged by its peers, all right? When I was growing up, um, a neighbor friend of mine uh, had gerbils, and um, all suddenly, all the gerbils started to attack one of the gerbils that started to eat them, okay? Now, it was pretty, pretty gross, pretty horrifying. And I I can't remember what they did. I think they tried to separate them in in different cages or whatever. But is that morally wrong for the animals to do? Do animals have morals? No. No one's calling the cops when a gerbil eats another gerbil. It may be horrifying to us, but they're just going by what their instincts are telling them to do, right? What makes humans different? Why do we hold people accountable when they do such horrible things? We don't eat our young some animals do. What makes us different? Why do we live as if there's an objective moral standard? I would argue it's because there is. Uh, here's what Richard Dawkins says about morality. We've gotten a little bit familiar with him from you know, the Ben Stein video earlier. But here's what he says. He says, there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, 
no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. We are machines for propagating DNA. It's every living object's sole reason for being. Guys, we're just copy machines. We're just meant to pass on our DNA. So it would seem as though Mr. Dawkins um, would agree with premise one. If there is no God, there are no objective moral values. Well, according to Dawkins, there is no God. And so here he's saying there's no good, there's no evil. So he would agree that there are no objective moral standards. However, elsewhere in his writings and lectures, Dawkins um, condemns such actions as harassment of homosexuals, the, indoc- the religious indoctrination of children, and the ancient Incan practice of human sacrifice. He condemns all those things as morally repugnant. He calls the doctrine of original sin morally obnoxious. In fact, here's what he says about God. He says that Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament, is arguably the most unpleasant character in all of fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, so on and so forth. Hold on. But here it seems like he agrees with premise two, that there is an object of morality. Before, he said there wasn't. There is no good or there is no evil. Okay, then Mr. Dawkins, how can you say such phrases as unjust? If there's nothing but pitiless indifference, no good, no evil, why are you using such a phrase as unjust? You're using an objective standard to support relativity. And um, this is where this idea gets dangerous. He says, I mean, when we punish people for doing the most horrible murders, maybe the attitude we should take is, oh, they were just determined by their molecules. It's stupid to punish them. What we should say is this unit has a faulty motherboard which needs to be replaced. What's he saying? He's saying that, what's that? Go ahead. We're computers, we're, we're machines. We can't help how we were programmed by natural selection. So you can't hold us accountable for what we couldn't help. Hey, we're just doing what our instincts and genetics tell us to do, right? So it's stupid to punish criminals. And um, in 1924, there was a trial of these two young men, uh, Nathan Leopold and Dickie Loeb. In 1924, they were like around 18 and 19. They were come from an affluent family and they had committed a murder of a 14-year-old boy, a horrific murder. There's such a public outcry for capital punishment for these guys that they wanted to see them get punished to the full extent of the law. And these guys were in college and they were heavily influenced by the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. Anyone heard of Nietzsche? Yeah, he was um, real big into this idea of the Ubermensch or the Superman, the idea that um, the ultimate man is the one who decides moral standards for himself and rises above the standards of the rest of society. He doesn't really care what anyone believes. He just knows what he does. He does what he wants, basically. Um, so they were kind of going by that. And when asked why they committed this murder, they said, for the thrill of it. Just because they could, just to get away with it, just to get a bang out of it. All right. Now in comes their defense attorney, Clarence Darrow. There's Clarence Darrow in the middle. Uh, Clarence Darrow is actually famous for another trial he was a part of later in 1925 called the Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee. Anyone ever heard of Scopes Monkey Trial? It's uh, portrayed in the book and in the movie Inherit the Wind. Well, this is him in 1924 defending Leopold and Loeb. And he was basically, um, his argument, I mean, now he knew he wasn't going to get these boys off scot-free. They had confessed to the murders. It was, the evidence was solid. But he was trying to get their sentence reduced. He didn't want them to go to the gallows. So he was just kind of trying to get it to reduce. And to use that, his argument was um, biological determinism. Basically saying, is Dickie Loeb to blame because of the infinite forces that were at work producing in him ages before he was born? Is he to blame because his machine is imperfect? He later says, nature is strong and she is pitiless. She works in her own mysterious ways and we are her, are her victims. We have not much to do with it ourselves. Nature takes this job in hand and we play our parts. It's like Dawkins says before, we shouldn't hold people accountable for the moral choices they make because we're all just programmed by our genetics and our DNA. Uh, Another evolutionary biologist named William Provine says, it's cruel to punish people for their crimes. What's interesting about that statement? 
He's using a word like cruel as an objective term to, to defend his subjective relativity. You're saying there is no objective standard, but you're using an objective standard to say that there is no objective standard. It doesn't make sense. So how about this? How about the idea, if it's cruel, to, if, it's, you know, if we can't hold people accountable for their crimes, why should we hold the judge and the jury accountable for sentencing them? They're just doing their thing. They're just going by how they were genetically wired. They were genetically wired to see that justice prevail. Why should we hold them accountable? How was that? Yeah, you know, you see the inconsistency there? All right. We really don't want to live in a society where we say that people are not responsible for their actions, that they're just hardwired to do certain things. We really don't. And that brings us, um, that brings us to theism. Uh, theism is the belief that there is a God, an intelligent higher power, who has given mankind moral standards through general revelation. As it says in Revelations 2, 14 to 15, for when the Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience bears witness. Um, basically saying that, you know, even people who haven't directly heard from God as the Israelites did on Sinai, they, they still know the difference between right and wrong. It's written on their hearts. It's, God has given us a conscience. So we really can't say that I'm, without a higher than human lawgiver, I mean, the, if there is no higher than human lawgiver, there, there, the idea of moral obligation is invalid. It, it can't work. If it's just you and me and we are deciding what objective moral standards are, who says that your thoughts are better than my thoughts? And when it comes to naturalism, you know, it, once we realize what morality really is under naturalism, just an illusion, just a, a thing fobbed off on us, our genetics to get us to cooperate, what reason do we have to, to obey it? What reason do we have to be moral if it's just an illusion to get us to, for society to propagate its DNA? Why should I do what's best for society in the long term when what's in the short term is really what I'm interested in? Does that make sense? All right, here's my conclusion. I'll leave it to you to decide whether or not you think I've done a decent job in here talking about, you know, objective moral standards and God existing. And there's the three premises again. If God does not exist, we can't call something right or wrong in the objective, factual sense. But we would say that, you know, our experiences, our, our deep sense and the way we live our lives tells us, screams to us that there is an objective moral standard, that the, the, the statement that murder is wrong is not just a preference statement. It's not a chocolate versus vanilla statement. It's a two plus two equals four statement. So therefore, God exists. So that's my conclusion. Um, now, the, I, I'm sure the question now begs, okay, therefore God exists. Okay, which God? And I'm going to leave that to Kyle in the next session to really talk to the specifics of that. But the cool thing about the, mor the moral argument is, is how naturally it can play into conversation. People make moral statements all the time. I mean, listen at your lunch tables at school. Someone's always going to be complaining about something being fair or right or wrong. And that's where you respectfully, as their friend, can say, this is an interesting, I mean, this is an interesting thing, point that you bring up. I'm not going to challenge you on whether that's right or wrong, but I want to ask you, what is your foundations for saying something is fair or right or wrong? Where do you get that idea? Where do we get these concepts, right? And you, can, and just, you just keep asking questions and see how they respond. You know, okay, is it a God? Okay, if so, which God? And how do you know? If there's not a God, by what basis do you, can you call anything truly good or evil? You're just giving your opinion. You're saying your opinion is better than everyone else's, and that's that. Why should I believe you? That's that. We're going to do small groups now, and I look forward to our question and answer sessions. Thanks.